Never mind. Okay, sharing my screen worked during the test, so we're gonna have to see how this goes. I don't know what everyone can see. Are you seeing a VS code or a- Are we seeing uh, the page? Just the page? Awesome, okay. I have two monitors, so I wasn't sure how this is gonna turn out. Okay, so news and announcements. Uh, the first one, Rust 1.54 coming out. Uh, in this version, they've stabilized some APIs uh, and the actual change that I thought was pretty interesting, oh, I just made it disappear, sorry, um, is that uh, attributes can invoke function like macros in this one. They gave an interesting example, which is uh, you could do an include string on your repo's readme if your readme was for some reason also a good documentation comment uh, just to show how it works. Uh, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. Uh, and then they show a, a kind of a more real example later, but I'm excited to be able to mess around with that. Uh, the second one is uh, Rust's most loved language, six years in a row. Uh, the rest of the dev survey is interesting to look through as well, but it's just fun to point out that Rust keeps winning this every year. Uh, third, Bevy just turned one. Uh, Bevy's a game engine built in Rust. Uh, it's got very popular over the past year. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with it, this post is filled with a bunch of good information about the project. Uh, Zelda has worked with Bevy a bit. I'm sure maybe some other people that are here have. So if you have any questions about it, uh, we can all talk later. This one is just a, a Twitter post, um, but they're close to stabilizing Rustling 2021. And this is how I found out that they do testing on the top 10,000 crates on crates.io. And then after they do that, they build every public crate to make sure they don't break anything. Uh, I couldn't find information on like specifically how that's done, uh, but I'll, I'll be sure to share that if I find it because I thought that was really interesting that they're even able to do that. Uh, this article I think is more interesting as like a proof of concept and something that's super useful. So I don't think, uh, don't read this thinking, I use NeoVim, I'm gonna put a Rust module, this is a good idea. It will like fully crash uh, your, your NeoVim running if there's any sort of mismatch with the C API. However, if you want to know how the author figured out how to compile a shared library that is also a valid Lua module that can uh, be read in, it's very interesting. It's not super long. I enjoyed it. On the exact opposite end of that, this is an Amos uh, article. Uh, we usually share these every time there is one because they're so good, but this is a really kind of in-depth dive into how futures work in Rust with a lot of tips from Cool Bear and uh, uh, some good examples of Rust code and errors. If you have any questions about futures or you want to like really know how they work, I'd really recommend reading this one. Uh, this, this one is about some cool unstable Rust features. I haven't used too much unstable Rust, uh, but this article is a good overview on several of the unstable compiler features. Uh, the interesting part, if you don't really care about unstable Rust, is that some of these are going to be stabilized by Rust 2021 or shortly after. Um, one of those that I did really like is format args capture. Let's see if I here we go. So what this one is going to allow is for named arguments to be placed inside of strings. Uh, if it is a macro that depends on format args, which is like print, format, write, a bunch of other ones, and so you can. Uh, print line like this instead of having to uh, leave those empty or with debug symbols and then after the fact kind of format everything together. Uh, there's a couple other ones that are going to be stabilized in 2021 or soon after, but this is the one I'm most excited for. And then finally, just for a kind of fun project, um, Z oxide is a replacement for CD. It's based on a program called Z that I had never heard of, um, but essentially what this what this does is it uh, keeps track of the directories you use most frequently by kind of like saving a local database of what you've been doing. And it uses a ranking algorithm to navigate to the best match. This version is uh, seemingly much faster than the previous versions according to the benchmarks. Um, and I, while I haven't used it to fully replace CD, uh, I've been using it for a few days and I've been enjoying it. It gets much better as you use it and it kind of builds up uh, the database of the kind of stuff that you're normally changing directory to. Uh, an interesting built-in too is it works really well with Fuzzy Finder. So if you type ZI, you open an interactive Fuzzy Finder of the database it created, you can kind of jump to 
any of the previous directory commands you've given it. And I just thought it was pretty neat. It uh, technically didn't come out this month, but I, did, I found out about it this month, so I included it. And uh, yeah, there wasn't too much going on this month, but uh, there's some kind of helpful articles. You can find this on the uh, Rust Meetup website under this month in Rust, uh, along with all the other ones from previous months. Cool. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, the bevy thing is cool. Um, it's if you've ever done any of the game stuff with Rust, it's surprisingly easy to use. Um, a lot of earlier game frameworks in Rust were kind of plagued by way too much abstraction and over reliance on traits and generics, and Bevy mostly avoids that. So if you've bounced off a Rust game framework before, Bevy's definitely worth trying, although it's definitely on the heavier end of things. Um, also, we're really close to the Rust 2021 edition. That's going to happen in like mid-October, I think. So I'm I'm really excited for that. It's going to be great. Um, cool. Well, hopefully Toth is ready now. Yep, I'm already. Okay, cool. So let's give it over to Toth for his talk. Can people see my screen? Yeah. OK. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Thought Gunter. And uh, today I'll be talking about creating lab simulations uh, for teachers and students using Rust. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a graduate of Northwestern University. I graduated with a PhD in high energy physics. Um, my programming background before coming to Rust was uh, programming in C++ and Python mainly for physics analyses. So it wasn't any um, kind of core, any coursework regarding programming or didn't have any schooling, real schooling uh, revolving around programming. So I think that's good to just give you context to how I approach these problems. Uh, so if you have any any suggestions about my, about the way I do things, uh, don't hesitate to, to let me know. Um, I'm currently working on some computer vision and computer hearing projects using Rust and you can uh, check it out if you uh, follow my Twitter link and my blog. Actually, this upcoming weekend I'll be doing, I'll be writing a blog post about using CUDA uh, with Rust. So if you're interested in CUDA, I should have something posted this week. Anywho, um, we're all here via Zoom uh, for this meetup. Um, and it's kind of been like that for a while and it's kind of what created this opportunity for me to produce labs um, for our students. So what happened, uh, so, so the story went goes as uh, the pandemic began during my final year of graduate school. So I was finishing up uh, graduate school and I was asked to TA labs. So if you all remember uh, labs in high school or labs in college, they kind of look like this, where you have a TA, someone probably looking like the guy who's wearing the white shirt here, explaining how the apparatus works, explaining the physics concepts. Um, you get to kind of gauge, uh, get an additional intuition about how things work via their mannerisms, right? They are able to kind of interact directly with the apparatus. Um, it's actually a really, a really good uh, process to kind of learn these topics. During COVID, however, you know, the, the, the classes looked a lot like this. Uh, no interaction, um, which so it became more like a like a classic lecture course. Um, but what made matters worse is not kind of this level of interaction, but the toolings with which we had to kind of communicate these phenomena and have uh, the students work with the labs. So the labs at the beginning of the pandemic, we primarily used a, a set of tools provided by FET. Uh, FET was or is a, a collection of physics interactive tools, which was produced by University of Colorado through a grant. So one of their professors um, is actually a Nobel laureate, and he gave or he used his money to produce these tools. These tools are actually really good and really great for middle school and high school level labs. They do more in, in the realm of showing you uh, what the, uh, giving you a model of the phenomena rather than being a full flight lab. This picture over here is an example of the circuit simulation lab. 
the polyhedron labs were another source of labs that Northwestern decided to use. Um, so while FET was free, the polyhedron labs uh, were actually paid for. You actually have to pay uh, per student. And these were uh, labs which were more, they used um, kind of 3D artwork, uh, geometries to kind of mimic the feel of a lab, but they were a lot less flexible than both the FET labs and the standard labs. So coming at the end or using these tools and going through this process, uh, both myself and the TAs were fairly frustrated about the, with regard to the tools we had to use with uh, not being able to have uh, complicated, complicated designs or just a general lack of, flex lack of flexibility when it came to presenting our, the information we wanted or even having students interact with the material. Uh, just to give an example, uh, if you remember the physics labs when you were in school, you might uh, have a set of masses which you don't know the, the mass of, or you don't you don't know how many kilograms or how many grams something is, um, and you have to do a measurement to obtain that answer. Most of these uh, simulations or these frameworks didn't have any tools to, or didn't have any way to do that or a way for a TA to kind of implement that themselves. Uh, so. From that bout of frustration, um, I thought, or I, I, I started thinking, maybe I can do something about this. Um, so what I wanted to do, or at this period of time, my thought process was, if I can construct a single quarter of labs, something that can be used on Windows, Mac, and Linux, uh, Linux because I use Linux, and the physicists uh, in the department use Linux quite often, uh, that exceeded the capabilities provided by, you know, kind of the current sources, resources that we have. And this would be um, kind of an asset for both Northwestern, but, you know, anyone who wanted to use this. And in addition, kind of prove to myself that, uh, you know, I can, I can program something interesting and useful for other people. But there were a few issues uh, with, with this kind of idea, one of which, uh, after TAing, I still hadn't graduated. I still hadn't completed my thesis. So this is something that I had to finish writing everything and had to uh, deliver my thesis after defend it. I also needed the blessings from the teachers who were over the lab courses. I had to kind of pitch to them like, hey, I want to do this thing and I'd like for it to be implemented in the, the next uh, quarter. And the other thing is I wanted to do it in Rust. Uh, a lot of the teachers or the professors you know, they didn't really know Rust. You know, these are uh, a set of, you know, 55 to, you know, 70 year olds who did their graduate degree using something like Fortran. Um, and they're just being pulled to use Python by their students. So they don't, they don't know what's new. And uh, they're often a little skeptical about new things. Um, so you might be asking me, okay, these are all the issues. Why exactly did I, did I want to use Rust? Um, so once, not on this list is I enjoy Rust quite a bit, uh, in part because uh, I feel like it has very few sharp edges. Um, so in C++ and C, I often stumble upon um, areas or parts of the language which can cause failures that I don't anticipate. And what Rust does, it is forces me to be kind of so explicit about what I want and have such an understanding about what I want that I rarely fall into kind of those patterns. In fact, the most common kind of sharp edge I ever receive is when um, I go beyond the index of an array, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the worst thing, uh, which is actually pretty good, at least to me. Uh, the other thing is that I had at this point about two years of uh, kind of doing little small projects so I had a bit of a code base development. I was really comfortable kind of using these things. Uh, and then the tool chain for Rust, if you want to have it compile on Mac, Windows, or Linux, uh, very simple, and it's the same with each operating system. So it's not like if I were to use C++ and then use Make or CMake on uh, Mac and Linux, but use Visual Studio on Windows, there's nothing like that. It's one tool, it's very easy. Um, and then lastly, you know, instead of maybe using something like Python, which has a whole different set of issues, uh, or maybe like C++ and maybe, we're well not C++, but maybe some language like uh, 
C sharp or C or something strange like that. Uh, the FFI support in Rust is really good. So whenever I wanted to use a library, let's say a C library that I really enjoyed, it was very easy to kind of use that right off the bat. Okay, so the timeline at this point was, uh, when I got this idea, it was uh, in August. Uh, so I began to pitch this to the professors in early September to kind of give blessings. Um, we decided to do a simulation on the on circuits, right? So that was the kind of our first simulation we did, or I did. Uh, the first demos were produced uh, between August and mid-November, so between uh, the first pitching and when I defended my thesis. I I took video, unfortunately I couldn't find them, but these demos were actually pretty bad and I'm, I'm pretty happy that they actually allowed me to continue. Uh, but you know, kind of starting up a project is, is very difficult. So a lot of the stuff is not particularly impressive at first. Uh, but then I defended my thesis in November and I was, uh, at that point, I was able to work full time on this project and then release um, starting in the first week of January. Uh, so what, what exactly did I come up with, right? Like how, how did things look? Uh, so the end project or the end product was a program that worked on both Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, I actually wrote the operating code for the operating system there uh, from scratch. So I was able to, to kind of do that um, without much trouble. I'll kind of get into the trouble that I have with that a little later on. Um, I was able to have instructors generate uh, content. So if you remember that side panel that was on the side of uh, on the right hand side of that screen, I think there's a share sure. on the right hand side of that screen. Um, they were able to kind of change what was in there. And they were also able to change the uh, some elements and properties of the circuit elements. Uh, additionally, uh, there was just a full complement of the undergraduate circuit elements. So you have everything from resistors to inductors, you have switches. Um, the alternating current can go from a sinusoidal to a step function. So it's it full flesh, right? You, you can use this for any uh, any kind of tool. And it had some elements that most didn't, right? You can save things to CSVs. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, but there are, there are a few problems, right? Of course. Uh, one of the first problems that I had was the operating system code for Mac. To do this, I had to go through. Uh, so Mac, at least the way, the way, the way I did it was to go through this objective C layer. And so you have to use a combination of, of the COCA and objective C bindings uh, for Rust. And I don't know if anyone has kind of like read through or like kind of looked through or used objective C, but the syntax is utterly foreign to me coming from C++ or, or C or Rust. And like that took um, a lot to kind of get used to and a lot to kind of work with. The other thing uh, was um, application translocation. So I had been developing on a rather older Mac uh, operating system. Uh, and when I moved over and started to distributing the program to the students, um, there was a period where the Mac students cannot open any files within the program. And this was because, uh, so if, if you all have ever used a foreign application before, that you know that once you download the foreign application, you have to uh, go through a set of kind of hidden, hidden um, menus to tell the tell your operating system it's okay for for me to use this. Well, on Mac, even after you go through that initial set of menus, the if you get the application from the internet and and it's and you have the your, your operating system like let's say expand like a folder or to your desktop it will translocate it will move your application to some hidden directory so that if your application is malicious it can't access any of the files right this is after you said it's okay so what you have to do i didn't learn this until like i had this huge issue where you know all our max max students can use anything what you have to do is you have to move the application, like the executable yourself, from 
like the folder that the operating system, ex, you know, put it to somewhere else and then, and then you can do it. But the trick is that it asks you again, is it okay if it works, if it kind of accesses this directory? So it's, it's like, it's, it's so kind of handholdy and kind of, you know, hurts any, any developer that isn't working through their system. Uh, that, that was just like, that, that was one of those times where I didn't know what was going on and I was panicking for, for a while, but definitely one of those moments where uh, a bit of a bit learning experience, I'll say, right? Um, so, which brings me to kind of some of the helpful tips, right? So I think this, this my first tip kind of comes from that last story, which it might be on the, the next slide, but uh, the first tip is if you're, if you're gonna kind of deliver this, you wanna, have a level of testing um, that's robust. And ro by robust, I mean, get all of your testers to test every aspect of the application. I had a lot of testers, I had a lot of people helping me out, but um, it was one of those moments where this thing kind of fell through the cracks. Uh, and it's super unfortunate because we had one class where every student used a Mac. And so the TA had to kind of show people how to work, how, how, how things were supposed to be run. That was just, you know, like one of those super unfortunate aspects that that can that can happen uh, when developing software. But on to these tips. Uh, so first, uh, this was mentioned. The first tip is uh, std.rs, which is the HTML uh, directly to the documentation for um, for Rust, like the standard library. This was mentioned at a Rust meetup a while ago. Um, but this is something that I use all the time. And I think it'd be helpful if one forgets this exists. Uh, the other one is uh, if you're if you want to kind of test out a component of your complicated, I say program, like I was often doing with doing circuit stuff. Uh, tests are really good for that, and I don't really mean making unit tests. I mean if you just have a function, you just want to pass some data through a function to see what happens. Uh, tests are, are great ways to kind of quickly iterate on code that you want to integrate. Um, the other thing is uh, it's kind of a way of constructing functions with default parameters. Um, that is, if you have, let's say, a function where you have a few elements or a few um, inputs to that function being constantly changing, you always want to set them, then you can have those up front and you have another set of inputs, which are, let's say, parameters, which are often the same, right? Can often have default values. What I found as a good way, as a good trick, is to have a struct with the derived default um, uh, trait associated. And then when you want to actually use that, you can, um, you can do something, you can actually make it, make it kind of easier. So let me like quickly demo this. This is probably really small, but let's, let's let's try. So you have like a function that says this, and you have some something like this, right? Uh, and then you want to pass through a set of parameters. Um, then if you make uh, params like struct uh, params to have default on it. Then what you can do is that when you actually want to use this function, you can actually set A, set B, and then for C, you can do something like you call params, then you can set a subset of those elements, right? Let's say it has an element A and that's X for some reason. Then if you don't know, or if you want everything else to be default, you do this. And then this would automatically set the rest of the parameters for you as the default parameters. And this is like one of those tricks, which I don't know how I found out about this, but when I found out about it, it kind of just kind of blew my mind. I assume this is used all the time now, but it's one of those tricks which I found really helpful. Um, so yeah, so in the end, 
uh, I was able to make a really, really cool, widely used circuit simulation. I think that I had over 400 people, 400 students, well over 400 students use it, mostly without any issues, except for the Mac thing. Um, so yeah, any questions? This is super cool. Uh, a couple things. Um, using default like that is great. However, if you have a struct with private fields, your SOL, that's uh, one of its uh, sad shortcomings. Um, there are ways to like work around that that basically involve you making a, like a builder pattern or like a subset of that object. And then uh, that subset can be used to create the full thing. But yeah, it's a, it's a, if you're using default, you have to have a, a struct with public fields. Um, also, I can I too can speak to the difficulty of developing for Mac. I find it ridiculously difficult. I struggled with their documentation. It's hard, and I I want to commend you and give you a huge thumbs up for getting your thing in front of 400 people, because that is awesome. Uh, and then uh, other than that, um, well, yeah, now yeah, user testing, user testing will show yeah. you why you're bad every single time. Every time we go into user testing, it's a thing. Uh, Thomas has a lot of experience with that, but yeah, this is super cool. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, um, definitely the Mac thing, you know, it's a pain, but, but also user testing, like you said, there were parts where, oh my God, like it went from programming, a programming exercise to a a user interface design exercise really quickly. And then most of my time was like setting up the buttons so that it made sense or like having like, you know, if you notice on the, okay, so you have circuit elements, right? So one thing you might wanna do with the circuit element is to rotate it. Uh, and there were iterations where people didn't understand or didn't know they could. So I have to like, add and implement little tricks to kind of cue in people subconsciously to what they could do. This is, this is really interesting. Um, I, I'm actually very curious about the UI. I was wondering if you could talk about how you put that together. Yeah, so um, so all the UI stuff I actually did by hand, um, for better or for worse. Uh, so, OK, there's a bunch of things to talk about with, with how everything is set up. Um, the first off, the first thing is that this is all running CPU side. Uh, I did that because um, I didn't want to deal with any kind of weird driver headaches. I had also heard that Mac was deprecating OpenGL, so I didn't want to mess, the mess with less. I mean, metal, right? Um, so like everything, everything. So what's good about this is that everything has the same layout for the most part, right? So. This looks a lot like this, except the parameters change. So I can do some things like I know um, how large the font is. So whenever I want to add new elements, I can kind of do that programmatically uh, so it can render well. Um, well, I, and, and there are only what, what uh, nine of these. So it was not, it wasn't entirely done um, kind of individually, but, you know, everything was kind of just built from a rect and then rendered to a, uh, like a sub buffer. Um, and then that's, that's what happened. Um, another thing with the rendering stuff is rendering the text is actually really expensive. So I did a lot of uh, buffering each, well, essentially caching the renders of each character to memory and then kind of using those, I guess fetch, fetching those caches when I actually wanted to render it to the to the screen. That that is a totally normal thing. Layout is tough. Um, that's why a lot of UIs are declarative. I they'll look at state and if something depends on state, it'll know. And so it will never re-render things that haven't had their state change. And that's probably the biggest optimization that people use to get around that. That's how React works. That's how Druid works. It's a it's a whole thing, though. Text layout itself is way more complex than most people give it credit for. 
Yeah. Any other questions? No, but this is this is pretty cool. And also I want a third that the Mac sucks to deploy apps to and the documentation is confusing. Um, did you have any issues with like code signing where you were getting a pop-up that these were this was from like a dangerous developer or did the students just not care about the pop-up? Okay, so we got that pop-up. So there's there's two things to this. One, yes, we got that pop-up. Two, the TA essentially told the students that yeah, it's fine, open it up. Two, on the the um, FET uh, program, the same pop-ups happened there. So like we would have had the same problem, uh, and they oh, would have, okay. yeah, it almost like didn't matter. Um, for the for the polyhedron stuff, it was different because they would be accessing the polyhedron stuff from a server. So it was all through the, the um, uh, oh man, the web browser, yeah. Well, uh, unless anyone has any other questions. Steve? What's, what, what's next for the project? Is this, next? Uh, do you have other simulations planned or? So this is this is the end of this project. I kind of did every almost everything I, I wanted to do uh, here. Um, for other simulations, I've kind of moved past the simulation work. Like this was for Northwestern, um, and while doing more simulations would be cool and, and interesting. Um, right now, I'm working on uh, some computer vision AI stuff. And that's, it's kind of been taking the most of my time, the bulk of my time. How's the uh, Rust library support for computer vision? Oh, it's, it's not, it's not existent essentially. I mean, there, there's some people who do some stuff. So there's like uh, some people who did a Rust binding of some of the tensor, not TensorFlow. Uh, well, the TensorFlow folks did a Rust binding, but you have to use bezel and a bunch of other um, stuff to get it to work. And that's really clunky. Um, there is one group of people who did some CUDA support, but right now I'm finding that it's just easier to go through uh, the C APIs, especially the CUDA APIs. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but like, yeah. Well, cool. Thank you so much for presenting that. Um, I love anything to do with UIs and Rust, so I love that. Um, if we were in person, we would take a break now. But since we're we're not in real person, no free pizza. Uh, there's not as much of a need. Um, however, we'll do one. We'll do like a, a two minute break or three minute break. So feel free to go and, and do something else for three minutes and I'll make sure nothing interesting happens. Whoever's doing the recording had pause. Oh yeah, good idea. You know what, the talk's over. I'm just gonna stop the recording. They're gonna have to attend for the cool stuff. <laughs> Fair enough.